Hallie Kasser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieKasserJane.com. Thank you so much for being here. I am Hallie Kasser Jane. Today on the Hallie Kasser Jane Show, someone whose name you might not recognize, but whose voice will be familiar, and whose face you've seen a million times on both the large and small screen. Joining me at my table is character actor, podcaster, author, writer, director, producer, Stephen Tobolowsky. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to The Hallie Kasser Jane Show. The Hallie Kasser Jane Show is always available online at HallieKasserJane.com and a host of venues, including Blog Talk Radio and iHeart Radio. Today, The Hallie Kasser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Hallie Kasser Chain Show. If you ran into Stephen Tobolowsky on the street, you might say to yourself, hmm, haven't we met before? Did we date, play in the sandbox together as kids? Were we once married? Ha! Well, you probably have seen him before, because character actor Stephen Tobolowsky is everywhere, having appeared in productions that range from Deadwood to Glee to the Goldbergs, from Mississippi Burning to Groundhog Day, in the part of the annoying but endearing insurance salesman Ned Ryerson, annoying his stock in trade. And still, Tobolowsky is so much more. As a dazzling storyteller and writer, he has earned a devoted fan base for his original stories recorded in the popular podcast, The Tobolowsky Files. And he is the author of The Dangerous Animal Club, billed as a creative mitzvah, a work of art, and a narrative feat that combines biography and essay. But that's not all. In March, he'll be part of the hilarious ensemble cast in Comedy Central's new series, Big Time in Hollywood, Florida, executive produced by Ben Stiller. Let's talk. Okay, Mr. Stephen Tobolowski, 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 Tobolowski. <laughs> talk to me. I'm asking too. you, what's the deal with that name? I love the name. Are we on the air? We're on the air. Oh, well, this is that good of a story because I had no idea how to pronounce my name either because different people in my family pronounce it different ways. Tobolowski, Tobolowski, Tobolowski. <laughs> Tabalowski. So I asked the pretty much our historian of the family, Uncle Nathan, about 10 years ago. So this means I'm in my 50s. I asked Uncle Nathan how we pronounce our name, Tabalowski, whatever. And he says, you can pronounce it any way you want because it's not really your name. What? Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello. So, you know, I have this small seizure and I, I say, excuse me, please. What? Explain. And he says, well, when grandfather came to America, he did not go to Ellis Island. He embarkated in uh, Galveston, Texas. And when he got off of the boat, they asked him, who are you? And grandfather, who didn't speak English, only kind of spoke Yiddish and Hebrew and some German, thought the who and Russian and Polish, of course, thought the who, wo, is where in <laughs> German. So he thought that the man asked him, where are you from? And he answered, Abram from Toblosk in a kind of Russian Hebrew sort of way, which the guy in Texas didn't understand. So he did stamp and he named him Abram Tobolowsky. So... Hallie, that yeah. means I got my name the same way Don Corleone got <laughs> his name in The Godfather. <laughs> yeah. That's how I got mine. <laughs> So, uh, well, us Jews, you know, it's kind of a weird deal there. So listen to me, buddy. You act, you write, you talk, and you talk well. You direct, you produce, and do you ever sleep? I mean, what's the deal with you, buddy? I mean, you're everywhere. You have to I'm, not sleep. I'm having trouble with the sleeping lately. I, I reached, now, you know, some people in your audience may be aware of this, but there's an age you get to, like sometime in the 50s, in which martinis don't put you to sleep anymore. <laughs> That they wake you up, and coffee puts you to sleep. You, you kind of go on this reverse cycle. So I have to be very careful now in the evenings not to have anything like wine or anything that normally would put you to sleep that stimulates you. 
I look forward to my sleep because I dream and have a very active dream life. And I've always been able to remember major dreams in my life. So this is an important part. Being (laughs) being (laughs) unconscious is very important to me. (laughs) Very important. The favorite part of the night or the day, right? There you go. So listen, this is also interesting. First of all, you do not sound like you're from Texas. That is the weirdest Texas accent I've ever heard. And you are from Texas, right? I am from Dallas, Texas, but my mother was from Pennsylvania, Troop, Pennsylvania, which is right near Wilkes Barre. That's Barra where you Scranton. got that. Yeah, I hear the O in your voice. Yeah, I couldn't figure so, that so, out. Yeah, so that's from uh, Pennsylvania. So I do have a kind of not very good Texas accent. So anyway, what are your parents like? Were they good parents? I, boy, I uh, certainly I think they were wonderful parents. I was lucky I had the parents I had. My mother is no longer with us. She was the spiritual center of the family, the philosopher in chief of our family. My father was gone working all the time. He was a family doctor, always working, always working. But it was my father who, in a way, taught me the alphabet. When I was a little, little boy, he gave me little, little blackboard and we'll we'll keep the parallelism going and a little little piece of chalk and every day before dad went to work he would put a letter of the alphabet on that board and it was my job to come up with five words that day that started with that letter and my mother I would go on chores with mom during the day and we would look for my words and I remember being very very excited the very first day we did this teaching method the first letter being A and dad told me that day I only needed to come up with four words because A itself was a word. And I thought, how good is life going to be? <laughs> I mean, it's so easy. Yeah. Just just the letters themselves are words. So mom and I had a wonderful time growing up. Primary teacher was mom. So it was uh, a good childhood. I think good childhood. I grew up in the country. Recently, my father is now, bless his heart, 92. Mm. And he apologized for not being able to buy us toys and things when we were little. And I had no idea. <laughs> we were <laughs> deprived. <laughs> We grew, I mean, we grew up in the woods, in the creek, and it was always something wonderful and horrible going on at the creek. There were snakes and spiders and all sorts of fantastic things, poisonous plants. It was a wonderland, and I spent all day in the woods, and you can't get, you know, I, I don't want to be like every grown-up that always looks back at this generation and says, oh my gosh, these poor kids. But when I grew up, I had a lot of nature around me, and I just don't know if kids have that kind of nature around them anymore because it is fulfilling to be in that kind of active silence. There is something about it that's so stimulating to the imagination. Mm, mm. Uh, I get that. And kids don't go out today. That's really a weird thing about kids today. No, That's right. a really yeah. sad thing. So listen to me. You're really good at playing annoying characters. We're going to talk about that later. But <laughs> before we get to that, were you the annoying kid on the school playground? I mean, I, I think I was. Oh, God. I, 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 but, but I was a great student in first grade and a great student in kindergarten because all I wanted to do, like a lot of little kids, was to go to school because it meant I was going to be a grown-up. But I ran into that roadblock in second grade. And it was the first time we had long-term assignments. And the teacher had 10 books that we had to read outside of class. And the first book was something called Bucky Beaver Goes to New York. And And this was the longest book I had ever seen in my young life. This book was like 240 pages, something like this. Well, I missed the part where the teacher said we could read at our own pace. (laughs) And I thought the book had to be read the next day after she gave everybody a copy of the book. And so I broke into a flop sweat and I went home and I asked my brother if such a thing were possible. And he said, well, he heard in college people had to work really hard and read all the time. So I started reading Bucky Beaver and I read Bucky Beaver all day and I read Bucky Beaver all night and I read Bucky Beaver in the morning. I developed new speed reading techniques to read with greater number of pages, less comprehension. But I finally got to that magical the end before I got to school the next day. And I had never worked so hard in my life. We got to class and the teacher said, how many of you read any of your Bucky Beaver? And of course, everybody raised their hand. And she said, how many of you read chapter one? Everybody raised their hand. And right then I was thinking like, well, yeah, well, if you read the whole book, of course you read chapter one. 
Then she said, how many of you read chapter two? And about half the class raised their hand. And that was when I was getting the idea that I had misinterpreted the assignment. How many of you read chapter three? By the time it got to how many of you read chapter four, there are only like three or four of us raising their hand. And she went around the room and said, Claire, how many chapters did you read? And Claire said, well, I read four and I began chapter five. Then she said, Stephen, how many chapters did you read? And I was so proud. And I was ready for the praise that I was so worthy of. And I said, I read the whole book. And the entire class broke out an enormous laugh. And the teacher's face turned to this scowl. And she said, how dare you lie to this class? (gasps) And I was going, what? What? And she said, I want you to stand up right now and apologize to this class for being a clown and carrying on like this. I I said, "But, but I did read the whole book. She made me come up to class, and she said, tell them. Tell everybody you lied. And I said, but I didn't. She said, go out into the hallway. And I stood in the hallway, trembling. And the teacher came out to me, and she said, Stephen, I will not have liars in my class, and I will not have children acting out like this. Now, you look me in the eye, and you tell me, how much did you read? And I was trembling, and I said, I read the first chapter. And she said, you stand out here for the rest of the period. And she says, I want you to take that book home, and I don't want you to turn that book in until you finish reading. Well, I now had another problem that I didn't encounter. Now I had to come up with a whole new lie as to when I actually finished the book. And a funny thing happened was that after two weeks, I thought, well, maybe that wasn't enough time for Bucky Beaver to get to New York. So I didn't turn the book in. And then was four weeks, and I didn't turn it in. Finally, after about six weeks, I turned the book in. And she gave me the second book, which I did not read. And I did not read any other book in that class, nor did I read books in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And from that point on, I was the class clown, but was no longer the good student. In fact, I didn't start really reading again till college. And that's where I learned the lesson that teachers make a difference. Oh, yeah. Make a big difference. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, now what do you want me to do with that? You've got me completely entrenched in that story. My heart is pounding. My eyes are tearing. <laughs> it's terrible. What, 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 and you what, want me to go on and talk to you for the rest but, but of listen, the hour? Listen, you know, my adult brain, you know, I look back at that Bucky Beaver event all the time, and I ask myself, you know, had I been in her place, there's so many things I could have done instead. Like I could have said, name five things that happened in the last chapter of Bucky Beaver Goes to New York. Who is Bucky Beaver's friend when he gets off the train to New York? All these questions I could have asked had I read the book. So I assumed that my teacher had to use the kind of atom bomb on me because she hadn't read the book herself. Can we name that teacher? Is she still alive? (laughs) She's no longer with us. The teacher who did this was Mrs. Cooper. And a friend of mine from that class has grown up to be a philosopher. Now, how many people you know that grew up to be a philosopher? And she got her degree from Oxford and Harvard. And I told her the story of Bucky Beaver in New York when we had breakfast at the Carlisle not long ago in New York. And she said, Mrs. Cooper, Mrs. (gasps) Cooper, don't get me started on Mrs. Cooper. So Sally Naomi Jones was how I knew her then. She has a new name now. But Sally Naomi Jones, she had a run-in with Mrs. Cooper, too. But, you know, you win some and you lose some when, Listen, you, when you're in you, education. You came out all right. <laughs> I came out all right. You I damn did. well came. And it may be because you were into Davy Crockett, king of the wild <laughs> front tier. <laughs> I was into Davy Crockett. Now, now that was another terrible story because uh-huh. I loved Davy Crockett. I thought there was nothing better than Davy Crockett. And I was over the moon when I heard that Disney had done a movie, <laughs> a movie at the movie theater about Davy Crockett, Davy Crockett at the Alamo. And I thought, this is going to be the bestest movie in the world. And I showed up in Dallas that cold, cold, cold morning wearing my Davy Crockett hat with about 400 other little kids wearing Davy Crockett hats. It was like we went into that movie theater and walked into an airplane propeller. We had no idea what the Alamo was. We had no idea what was going to happen. And we watched Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, (laughs) 
uh, William Travis get slaughtered before our very eyes at the Alamo when what I was when did that movie come out like 54 55 you know it, I was like four or five years old and that's when I had all my dreams dashed your dad <laughs> gave you your coonskin cap do you still have it no oh. 